I'm really excited to continue in the sermon series that we're in. If you've got your Bibles, uh, we'll start out in Ephesians chapter 6. We're in a foundation series and kind of got the idea. I don't know if you're uh, too familiar with Xenia, but if you drive around, you can see there's a lot of construction and things that are going on, uh, a lot of great things that are happening here in the city. I'm really encouraged by it. But I was driving by, and I saw the white truck and the guy with the white hard hat um, and the, the big notepad get out of his truck. And I knew exactly what it was when I saw it. It was the inspector. And uh, if you know anything about construction, at different phases on the construction project, uh, an inspector will come and make sure that things are where they need to be. Uh, one of the most crucial things for an inspector to check on is the foundation. And it's the beginning process of any kind of construction or any type of build. And what they'll do is they'll come out and they'll make sure that the foundation is safe and that it can support what's getting ready to be built on that foundation. Uh, and when I saw that, it just reminded me how important it is for us as Christ followers to have good, good and healthy and mature foundations. It's essential for us. So over the last couple of weeks in this series, uh, we've talked about the foundation of salvation. We've talked about, Jaden talked about prayer in week two. We've talked about the word of God. We've talked about worship, just some really crucial things for us as Christ followers, when it comes to the foundation of our discipleship today, I'm encouraged to talk to you about spiritual warfare, which is a topic um, that a lot of people have different thoughts on. Uh, but I love uh, what C.S. Lewis says and how he describes it. It's one of the ways that I use to describe it as well. Um, if you were here for the Blessed Life series, you'll remember this phrase. For every one mile of road, there's two, mile of, there's two miles of ditch. It's the same thing. Uh, when it comes to spiritual warfare and people's approach towards spiritual warfare. So for every one mile of road, there's two mile of ditch. In one ditch, we have the camp that is just kind of like out of sight, out of mind. I don't believe in it. That's spooky. That's weird. I'm not engaging in that. That's only for weird Christians. I don't know anything about that. Those people are kind of weird. Fruit Loop, that, I don't know. I don't know about it. And they just kind of downplay it and just, you know, pretend as if the devil isn't real and that spiritual things don't happen and it just, you know, God controls all and there's no kind of opposition. That's one ditch. But then on the other ditch, uh, you have people that think that the devil hides under every rock. Uh, these, these are the people that um, you get a flat tire and they think that it's the devil coming against them, uh, that they have a low tank of gas and they think it's gas tank demons, like are just out, out to, they're just out to get them. Uh, you just literally did not fill up your gas tank. It is not the devil attacking you. Just fill your car up. Uh, so for every one mile of road, you've got two mile of ditch. And, and we want to be right there in the middle. And, and Paul, uh, through a few different of his letters, gives us a great approach to it. So I want to do uh, really an overview on spiritual warfare. Um, honestly, this, this sermon alone should probably take me at least three weeks. So I hope your hands are ready and your minds are open because we're really, we're going to dive in. This, this is probably three or four weeks of content that I'm just going to, I feel like a fire hydrant just so if you're a note taker, get ready, all right? Um, so Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 11. A final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word that is the infallible, inspired, authoritative word of God. We love your word. God, thank you that uh, John says that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word became flesh and dwelt, dwelt among us. Thank you that you wrote scripture through human hands, but it's divinely inspired. Lord, that your word represents seed and our heart represents soil. Opinion amounts to nothing today, but your word that is incorruptible can make a difference in people's life, and that's what we're going for. That's our aim today. So, Father, thank you that your word will not go out and come back void, but thank you for what you're going to accomplish today by your word. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Barna, uh, which is a research um, study group that uh, they do a lot of intentional statistics and studies specifically for uh, Christian values and faith, 
Um, and I like to use them. They're, they're a great resource. It'll kind of give you a, uh, an idea of what's going on in the body of Christ. Barna Research did a study. They said 40% of, people's, uh, of people who would confess to be born-again Christians uh, believe that the devil is not real, but he's a figment of evil. So he's just a symbol. 40% of born-again Christians, Barna Research, would say that 40% of people who are churchgoers who confess Jesus as Lord think that the enemy, the devil, is just a symbol but not a real being, 40%. That's four out of every 10 people believe that he's just imaginary and that he's made up. I was reading this, uh, a study a couple months ago, and it was about Tesla. Tesla's got their cyber truck coming out. It's kind of nerdy. That's kind of cool. Uh, but Tesla overall is just, just kind of neat. But I was reading a study about Tesla. There's a guy in California who's been arrested five times because he's been pulled over seven for crawling in the back seat of his Tesla and falling asleep and just allowing the autopilot Tesla to take him down the highway. So he'll get started on his, on his drive to work and he'll go climb in the back seat and fall asleep and he, he'll get pulled over. He's, he's been pulled over seven times, been arrested five times. And when I was reading that, I was like, man, that sure does remind me a lot of the church. You know, we go to church, we got, you know, we'll read our Bible, we'll get involved in a home base, we'll do this or that. But it's like we're asleep in the back seat. I mean, you know, everything's moving forward. You know, our faith is seemingly growing and moving forward, but we're asleep while all of it's happening. And when I read that article, it just reminded me of just uh, how oftentimes uh, that can become where we are, no matter where you are in your spiritual maturity level. There are times when you and I, not intentionally, but unintentionally, disengage from a continually opposing force that's coming against you continually and unrelenting. And what we'll do is we'll just get in the middle of life, we'll get busy, we'll have things going on, we'll have finals coming up, a big project at work, we'll have a whole lot of drama going on or something like that to get our attention off and get us in the back seat of life, our spiritual life, while we just keep coasting on autopilot and moving forward. Can I just encourage you? Your spiritual life is not meant to be lived in autopilot. Like you're, you're, you're not some nice big old Delta airplane crossing the transatlantic and once you get up to flying altitude, just cruise and sit back. You are, you are meant to be a fighter pilot in the kingdom of God, engaged and knowing what's going on and be active and be intentional about it. And that's what Paul's describing in the book of Ephesians. He's writing to the church in Ephesus and notice, notice the things that I've underlined and some other things that he's saying in chapter six. He says, put on. When he, write, when he wrote put on, I circled that in my Bible because that means that there's some responsibility on me. You know, a lot of us, we like to pray, and it sounds, you know, well-meaning, you know, God, whatever your will is, you know, just let it be done. And that is a great prayer. But, you know, there's some responsibility on your end with your own spiritual development and your own discipleship and your walk with Christ. And part of that is being engaged in a spiritual battle. And that's putting on, and Paul's describing armor that, he, that, that he's already told us about and that he's getting ready to continue to tell us about, talking about the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the spirit that's the word of God, the belt of truth, the shoes of peace, the shield of faith, all these different uh, pieces of armor, and Paul's telling us, put them on, actively put them on, you, be intentional, actively put them on so that you'll be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. Other translations might say all wiles of the devil or all cunning or all trickery. And for me, I circled that because I wanted to be reminded that our enemy, he's a trickster. He's very cunning. The Bible describes him as an angel of light. And here's the thing about him that a lot of people don't pay a lot of attention to is he has been watching you from day one. He knows all of your insecurities he knows all of the things that will make you bite when it comes to temptation. He knows all the points that you're weak in. He knows all of them, and he's watched you since you were born. And he knows exactly how to trick you. He knows exactly how to deceive you. Not only has he been watching you since you were born, but he's been watching you for generations. He's been watching your great-grandparents and your great-grandpa that, that, your, your great, your great that struggled with an addiction, your grandpa that struggled with an addiction, your dad that struggled with addiction, and now you're struggling. He's been watching he knows what we have a proclivity towards. He, he knows about it. And, he's, and the, the, the other reason I circle this is because the, the enemy is a strategist. He has a game plan. He's intentional. He's not just like nail, nailing jello to the wall, whatever sticks will stick. 
He's intentional. He watches you. He's got a strategy. I think you and I would engage in spiritual warfare a lot differently if we took serious that the enemy is strategizing a plan against you, a plan against your marriage, a plan against your children, a plan against your spiritual life and your money. And he's got a plan and a strategy. He's strategizing against you. So let me just nicely ask you, and you, you don't have to respond, but what is your strategy against him? Do you have an intentional strategy to oppose this enemy that Paul is saying that we need to put on armor for? Paul's saying don't play around. Paul's saying be intentional. So all strategies, then he goes on and says, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. Husband and wife, that's a great thing to bring up right in the heat of an argument. We don't wrestle each other. We're not wrestling. But it goes on, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, uh, but against evil rulers and authorities in the unseen world. Now, that unseen world, that sounds a little, whoo, little Casper, spooky ghost. Everybody gets a little weird when you say something like that. But you know what I'm talking about when I say that. It's that thing that, that you can just sense it. You, you don't have to describe it. We don't have to be weird about it. But you can just sense when something's off. You've been in the mall and somebody walked past you and they got some fuddy-dud stuff going on. You're like, I don't know what's on you, but you need to back away from me. Like, you, you've been in these realms. I don't know if you've ever traveled or, or been anywhere, but you, you step foot off a plane in Las Vegas, and you can, you can feel why they describe it as Sin City. Yeah. There's a weight. I don't know about you, but I've, I've walked the streets of downtown D.C., and that's one of the most spiritually heavy, heavy places I've ever been. Amen. You know, and things run in packs. You know, divorce runs in packs. You get, you get a friend group, and they, like, sin runs in packs. And, and like, that's just, it, it's just things, how things happen. Pornography addiction, it runs in packs. Like, all, all these things. Run, and it's, it's unseen stuff that people don't want to pay attention to and people want to downplay. But can I just encourage you as your pastor, we have to be strategic because he's going to be. So the first portion of this message is me just bringing to your attention just, just, just how real this is, how real the battle of spiritual warfare is. Because like for every one mile of road, there's two mile of ditch people that, you know, downplay it and then people that think the devil's under every rock. The same way is true uh, when, when it comes to the idea of engaging in spiritual warfare. There's some people that ignore it. There's some people that, that, that just ignore the problem and just think that it'll go away. And you know what I'm talking about. You've got problems in your house right now you've been ignoring, thinking they'll go away. Set the mousetrap. Like, <laughs> set the mousetrap. Fix the leaky pipe. Like, you know, do, do the maintenance. It, don't, don't ignore it. And th- uh, people love to do this with their health. Like, just ignore, oh, well, it'll get better. I'm doing it right now. I've got an infective wisdom tooth, but we're still moving on. You know? <laughs> but we ignore it thinking it'll get better. Or, or on this side, we'll fear it. We're, we're, we're fearful of it. So, so the whole idea of, of starting this message is to get it in your mind that we are in a battle, that this is real. And this is something that we have to proactively engage. So now I'm going to give you some tools on how we can engage with it and some things that God says about spiritual warfare. So I'm going to give you, first of all, four facts about your enemy. I think one of, one of the greatest things that you can do is, is know the team that you're facing. Like if you had an inside look on your opponent and you were able to know all the plays that they were going to run, the different things that they were going to do to try to defeat you, if you had an inside look, you're... you're you, you, you're going to have a really good chance if you know what's going on. So I'm going to give you four facts about the enemy. Number one, I'm coming against that 40%. Hopefully none of you are in the room, but the devil is real. No matter if you want to pretend he's a made-up figment of your imagination or just a character in Scripture, the devil is real. He's real. And he is alive. And he, he will oppose you. So I, I've got some references here that you can copy. Uh, obviously, the, these verses are a little bit longer, but I just wanted to pull out in Scripture what the, what the Bible actually says about our enemy, that he's the ruler of this world, of this world. That means the one that we're in, that this, this world. He's the ruler of this, or of this. He's the God, notice the, the little case G. He's the God of this age. He's the God of every age and generation. Like, he, he knows exactly. And he's been lining society up. Gener- I mean, he's strategic. Think about it. Generation after generation after. Things that three generations ago, if you would have asked them, do you think we'll ever struggle with this? They'd be like, you're having a conversation about what? 
that's up for debate? And he knows exactly what he's doing. He's, he's very strategic. So he's the God of this age. He's the prince of the power of the air. Um, Ephesians talks about a, a, a principality. Um, if you want to know what a principality, it's a prince over a palliate. A palliate is like a city. A prince is someone that governs over that. So this is, this is real. There's, and, and just, I, I don't want to get too, too deep into it, but just so you can know, the enemy has order and rank. Like there's order and rank when it comes to it. Like it's the kingdom of darkness and, he, and he's got ranks and he's got different things and he's got a strategy. So he's the prince of the power of the world. And, and then 1 John says this, the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. Or, or, the, or the sway of him. So to combat those 40% of Christians who believe that he's just a symbol, I'm just telling you he's not, and you don't need to treat him like he is. You need to treat him like he's real because he is. Like the, the enemy is real. It's point number one. Four facts about him. Number one is that he's real. Number two is that the devil is at war with us. You and I individually. Now, a lot of people are like, well, yeah, pastor, of course, you know, the enemy's probably going to wrestle you. You know, you're a pastor or whatever, and, you know, of course he's going to... Single mom, stay-at-home mom, he's attacking you. He doesn't want you to disciple those children. He wants you to belittle what you do. He wants you to think that the devil only comes after pastors. He doesn't just come after pastors. He's coming after you. Guy that works a 40-hour work week that just you don't like your job, but it just makes ends meet, he's coming after you. He's specifically coming after you, Dad, because you should see the statistics of families that go to churches for generations in past when the dad leads the church, leads the family to church. It's some 90%. So the, the enemy is very strategic and he is at war with you. The Bible says this in 1 Peter, be self-controlled, your enemy. I'd circle that or underline that because this is your enemy. It's not just home church's enemy or not just pastor's enemy. He's coming after you. He's coming after you, student. He's coming after you, grandma. He's coming after you. He prowls around like a roaring lion. Like a, he's not. There's one lion in the Bible, and that's Jesus. He's the lion of Judah. But he likes, to, he likes to walk around looking and acting like a lion, looking for someone to devour. Have you ever watched National Geographic and watched a, watched a lion? They're crazy. So I, I watch lions and, and how, they, how they do it on there, and I'm, I'm, I think it's kind of neat. But they're, they're strategic. They, here's what the lion looks for. They, they look for the one that's the most immature in the pack, the smallest one that can't keep up. So the immature. And then they look for the isolated. That's what the lions look for on National Geographic. That's what the enemy is looking for. He's looking for the people that are immature in the faith. Somebody came up to me before service and said, man, your boys are growing like a weed. And I said, yeah, I'd be real concerned if they weren't. But we can come to church for four or five years and not grow. That's scary. Five, six, we can get baptized and still be immature. Pay tithe and still be immature. Be in a home group, still be immature. So the enemy's looking for, for immaturity, and he's looking for isolation. How, how, how do you be immature? Well, we all obviously start immature, but don't stay that way. Then the other one, he's looking for the one that gets by himself. You get by yourself because you get offended. You get frustrated. You get discouraged. You get lazy, you get non-active, you do some couch discipleship with you and whoever on the TBN, that ain't going to cut it. You, you need a church family, you need a church body because the enemy is, he, he wants you to get out from under the pack, he wants you to get out from God's design. So the devil's at war with us. Number three, the devil has power. He does. You know, he doesn't have all power. The Bible says in Revelation that, that he, he has a certain extent of how long that power will go. The Bible says in Ephesians, in your anger, do not sin, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. This is one of my favorite verses <clears throat> in Scripture. There's just so much truth behind this. I want to break it down for you. So the devil has power. In your anger, do not sin. That means you're allowed to be angry. Angry people said amen. People that are just given to anger. That's, that's okay. You're allowed to be angry, but you have a time frame with anger. You have a time frame with it in your anger, and, and you've got some, some boundaries. You can be angry, but don't sin. What does that look like? You're allowed to be mad, but watch your mouth. That's sin. Your mouth will get you in trouble. So you're allowed to be angry, but have boundaries. This is ex extremely important in marriage, having boundaries with your mouth. You just have to. So in your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. That's the time frame. 
How many of you, you've ever been to a wedding and then they, they ask all the married couples to come up and they start dancing? And they say, if you've been married ha- uh, for a year, have a seat. Been married three years, have a seat. It goes all the way up. Then you got like this cute little old couple that's out there, been married 70 years. And they'll go up with a microphone and they always say, you know, what advice would you give the newly married couple? I guarantee you it's the same advice every time. Don't go to bed. Don't go to bed angry. They're saying what the Bible has been saying is truth for years. Don't go to bed angry. Because what happens is, is if you go to bed angry, you have, a time, you have a time slot to deal with it. And if you don't, you give a foothold to the devil. And that word devil there in the original language is the word diablos. That word means slanderer or the accuser. So let me read this verse back to you and describe it to you in original language. In your anger... Do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on you while you're still angry. And do not give a foothold to the slanderer or the accuser. Because what happens is, is you and your spouse will go to bed or you'll go to bed and be mad at a friend. And if you don't deal with it before the sun goes down, that opens up a door of access for the enemy to come in and start whispering about them in your ear. Man, your husband sure is lazy. Man, your husband sure is this. He don't care about you. He's this. He's that. And he'll counsel you all night. Or you go to bed, wife, or, or you go to bed, husband. You know, man, like, she sure is mean. You know, she, is she ever satisfied? You could be satisfied elsewhere. Another woman won't drive you crazy like that. He'll counsel you. You could be real quiet in here, but I know he whispers to you. He whispers to you about your friendships. They don't care about you. You're so much of a better friend than they are. You would have started a meal train for them. Like, he'd just be whispering stuff in your ear. Trying, and, and it's because you've given him access. And once you've given him access, he has authority. He can come in and start whispering because God's gave you the solution. Don't let the sun go down. So the devil's real. He's at war with us. He has power. Number four, the devil is subject to God. So this is, this is part of the good news. The devil is subject to God. First John chapter 4 says this, you dear, dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. We just had all those scriptures up about the devil being real and uh, him being the ruler and the God of this age and him being the prince and the power. All of those, are, th- those sound really great and really strong, and they are. I don't want to downplay them. But notice what John says, greater is he that is in you than the prince and the power of the air. Greater is he that is in you than the God of this age. Greater is he that is in you than the whole world that lies under his slander. And what's being described here is that's Christ Jesus upon salvation being in our heart. Greater is he who is in me than he who's coming against my marriage. He who's coming against this issue at work. He who's coming against my children. Greater is he that is in me than he who is opposing all these things. Greater is he that is in me than any addiction that would ever try to attack me. I'd love 12 steps, but it just takes one. His name's Jesus. Great, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Is, is what the, So I, I need for you to know uh, that the enemy is real. Now... I told you this should have been like a four-week sermon series, so sorry. I'm going to give you three tools for battle. I'm going to give you three tools for battle because if you and I are going to engage, we've got to know what to engage with. Uh, the first and foremost one is the name of Jesus, number one, the name of Jesus. If you're, if you're going to battle the enemy, you've got to know how to battle, and we battle with the name of Jesus. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, starting at verse 9, Therefore God elevated him, talking about Christ, to the place that is of highest honor and gave him the name that is above all other names. His name is above all names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Now now notice the realms that Paul is describing here in the book of Philippians as he's writing to the church in Philippi. He says this, at Jesus' name, that every knee shall bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. That's three realms. And Jesus has authority over all three realms. His name is powerful in the heavens. Who do we wrestle against? The prince and the power of the, the air in the heavens, on earth. 
Who has Satan deceived? All of us who are on the world. And he has authority under the world. So Jesus has all authority. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If you're in a spiritual battle, the greatest thing that you can do is proclaim the name of Jesus. And just remind yourself and remind the enemy, greater is he who lives in me than he that's in the world. And just, just remind the enemy that he's been defeated by Jesus, that Jesus overcame sin, death, hell, and the grave, and that he remains victorious. And because of that, the enemy has been defeated. And if you need a good way to remember that, think about in, in the garden, how was the enemy described as a, as a snake? He doesn't have feet. Sorry, that's, that's a dad joke. He's been defeated. Okay, sorry. My bad. Some of you just got that. <laughs> sorry. I'm going to get in trouble for that later. Romans chapter 10. Move on. Don't, don't tell my wife I said that. Romans chapter 10. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's power in his name. There's power in the name of Jesus. You get tempted, bring up Jesus. It'll make things awkward. You get in a struggle, bring up Jesus. You think about spending more than you need to spend, bring Jesus into it. Car salesman, where are you at in your relationship with Jesus? Like, that'd just be like, actually, where I'm not, I don't even want to give you this interest rate. It's terrible. Like, it's just, it's just bring Jesus into every scenario that you can bring him into. So three tools for battle. The name of Jesus. Number two is the word of God. It's essential. This is, this is how Jesus defeated the enemy uh, in the wilderness. Remember, he was tempted by the enemy for 40 days, and they went on this back and forth about Scripture. And, you know, the enemy just kept taking Scripture out of context, but Jesus kept reminding him, no, this is what the Word says. You and I have to battle the enemy with the Word, and I'll just be honest, the enemy knows the Word better than you and I combined. <coughs> so, for the Word of God is alive and it's powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. It cuts between your soul and your spirit, between joint and, and marrow, and it exposes the innermost thoughts and desires. That's one of the most scary verses in Scripture that I find. That the Bible exposes your innermost thoughts and desires. It exposes the why behind the what. Because you justify your what all day long. You don't, you don't have to be honest, but we're in church, so just try to be at least honest with yourself. You will justify your what all day long. Well, I talked to him because of this. Well, I said that because of this. Well, I responded this way because of this. If they wouldn't have done that, I wouldn't have done And you justify your what all day long. But if you open up the Bible, God will illuminate your why. And then you'll be like, oh, I'm wrestling with insecurity. I'm not, oh, I've got bitterness in my heart because, so the Bible will, will expose that to you. That's why the word of God is, is so great. It's great in confronting the enemy, but it's also good for confession for you to work through. So the name of Jesus, the word of God, and then number three, the power of the cross, the power of the cross. Revelation chapter one says, I am the living one. Talking about Jesus, I died, but look, I am alive forever. Jesus says, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys to death and the grave. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, because of his resurrection, he now has power that was afforded to him because of what he accomplished on the cross. Now, I want you to just think for a moment. Who's got like a pair of keys? Anybody right here, you got a pair of keys? You, come on, bring it on, bring them keys on up here. Okay, so you got some keys. I don't have keys, but check it out. If you give me keys, guess what? I can go out there and I can find a Nissan and I can drive it because you, you've given me your keys. So I could probably, you know, what's this one too? His word, okay. And then, so, and I could take your reward cards, your reward points if I wanted them. I could take all your reward points. If I just took his keys, I've got authority to his car. I could steal his reward points. I could get in his dad's work, take all the tools. I could do whatever I want because he gave me, he gave me, he gave me the keys. Because what do keys give you? They give you power, but they give you access and they give you authority. When you have keys, it's access and authority. And Jesus tells us, I've been given access and authority because of what was accomplished on the cross. So I have access over death, and I have access and authority over the grave. So because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross, he holds the keys. He holds the keys, which means like the enemy doesn't even have the keys to his own solution. 
His own solution is death, and he don't even have the keys to it. I just think Jesus is funny. Like, the things that Jesus says when I read it, I'm like, oh, you're throwing shade. Like, that, I just, like you literally took his keys to things that he is, like, most known for, death in the grave. And Jesus said, I'm just, I'll just take your keys. You can have the car, but I'll just have the keys. So remember that. Like, he, like he's, got, he's got keys. I was able to go spend some time with a family yesterday in hospice. And one of the things that I love saying in those situations is just for people that are in that room and, and in that hospital, I wish you had the peace that I have because I knew where she was going. I, I, I knew the transition that she's in. You just, death, death doesn't sting us. We just, from one, it's like taking a breath. I mean, you're just from one to the other. It doesn't make the process less painful or does it make it more excruciating when it comes to the emotions and the things that you're facing? I mean, it's painful. But we have access and we have authority that's been afforded to us. So the tools that we use is the name of Jesus, the word of God, the power of the cross. I hope this is helping you a little bit. This helps me. It, I mean, even if it's just for me and I'm just going over it, that's okay. I'll just let you in on my little devotion. Now, three decisions that, that you and I need to make. So if we, know, if we know that he's real, if we got some tools for battle, now, now what do I do? Number one, if you want to engage in spiritual warfare, you have to commit yourself to God. That's where it all starts, is you and I, afresh and anew, committing ourselves to God. Submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee you. So he gives us, he gives us steps here. And I love the Bible because I, I'm a step kind of guy. You know, Val, she'll give me a list of about seven or eight things that she needs around the house. I can't do that because I can't remember the second one. So I tell her one at a time, one at a time. So she'll tell me, so I'll go back to her and then I'll say, okay, I've done that. Now tell me the next one. So I want you to respond the same way. You, can, you can't move on to the next one until you've done the first one. And sometimes God will tell you what to do and you'll be looking for a fresh new word from God and he'll just whisper, do what I told you to like, he's just real good about just do what I've already told you to do. So submit to God, it starts there. You can't even resist the enemy if you're not submitted to God. You can't even start to resist him. And then he'll flee you. So it's a formula to get the enemy to flee from you. If you want to know how to get the enemy to flee, submit to God and resist the enemy. But you can't do one without the other. So you are, you are spinning your wheels in mud if you're submitting to God, but you're not actively resisting the enemy. It sounds good, but you're not accomplishing anything. It's, it's not either or, it's both and. But you're also non-productive if you're resisting the enemy, but you're not submitted to God. I know a lot of people that really love to do this. I mean, they'll come against the devil with Pam in their hands, spraying it all over their house, but they're just not submitted to God in any area of their life. Like, and it doesn't matter how many anointing oils that you order off of TBN, it's not going to change a thing. Until you, until you submit to God. Submit to him and, and resist. It's, it's both of them. And then, then he will flee. So this happens by us committing ourselves to God. Number two, we have to close open doors. Now, now, this one you have to be really intentional about. And I'm not telling you to be over spiritual, but you do need to be spiritual. I, I, I love when people say, now I don't want to talk about any, anything over spiritual. Well, you don't want to talk about anything spiritual. So I'm telling you, like, you have got to close the door to some, to some things. There's some, there's some things on TV you just need to quit watching. It's, it's slipping in your soul. Like, you struggle with pornography, but you think that you can watch a show that's got half-naked women on it for five seasons? What's wrong with you? Close the door. You're wondering why you're struggling. Close the door. Listen to songs that are just talking about all kinds of crazy stuff. You battle with depression, and you're jamming out to Hank Williams tearing my beer. That don't make no sense. Like, <laughs> close the door. <laughs> close the door. So there's some, there's some doors that you and I have to close, and we have to be intentional. And parents, you got to be real intentional about the doors that you open to your children, what they see on that screen that parents them for a while. Like, you gotta be, you got to be careful what, what you put in front of them. So somebody got loose. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10. If you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. And what I have forgiven, if there, uh, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven him in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. So the, the enemy's trying to outwit you, and he has schemes. 
he, he's, trying to, he's trying to tug on any open doors. Hebrews chapter 12. Look after each of us so that none of us fails. That's why church is so crucial. That's, that's why the Bible says, uh, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Church is essential. I thought it was so funny during the pandemic that they tried to cancel everything that was not essential, and they tried to say that the church was not essential. That's the most essential thing there is. Is for, is for people to get together. Is for, for people, like, it's so essential for us to get together. So that, uh, so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. I put this in there because I want you to understand that bitterness is a root just to show you that it comes from an open door. How it happens is you get offended. Something offends you, and you don't deal with it before the sun goes down. So offense turns into anger. Anger turns into malice. Malice turns into rage. And rage turns into bitterness. And then you're just bitter at somebody, or you're bitter at a circumstance, or you're bitter at a... You know what I'm talking about. So people... They, they hold it on their face. It's like they suck sour pickles like in the morning. It's like they just wake up and they're just, they're just bitter at life. And it's because they, they haven't dealt with anything. They, they haven't dealt with anything. So closing doors is going back and, con, and confronting things and, and, and bringing up. You know, just this week, I've, I've had three conversations. Hey, just want to let you know, here's where you frustrated me. Because I know if I don't, I'm holding on to that. I've had three or four people, re- hey, I just want to tell you where you frustrated. That's healthy. Healthy confrontation is confrontation, continually. Like, people want to store up. Marriage couples are, are notorious for this. They, they don't want to say anything for a year, and then they'll have a big blow up and then divorce. Or something will be detrimentally done or said. You know, if you just learn, it's like a pressure cooker. You just got to learn to relieve that valve every now and then. Me and Val are real good about it. We, I mean, we'll argue every day. But I'd rather argue with Val five times a day than become ships passing in the harbor. Because, I mean, we are strong-willed, and we'll let each other know. Like, it don't matter. She'll stand her ground, and I'll stand mine. We love each other. But I'd much rather do that with her every day than become ships just passing the harbor. So there, there's things that you got to be aware of uh, when it comes to doors. So committing myself to God, closing doors. Then number three, confronting with prayer. James 4 says this. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. You draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So this is just an extended version of the one that we talked about earlier. So confronting the enemy in prayer, this is active. So I want to describe this verse to you a little bit up top as well. So we've already went through uh, submitting ourselves to God, resisting the enemy, and him fleeing. We've got that down, right? We understand how that, that process works. But notice it goes on. James describes that there's a continuation of this process. After you've submitted to God, after you've resisted the enemy, and after he fled, there's still something that you have to do. And the reason that I know that there's something that you have to do is because remember when Jesus was giving the parable and he was talking about um, how the enemy would come and find the house in order and he'd go away and then he'd come back and look for a more opportune time and he'd come in, ransack the house and go and find seven and come back later. Like he just shares this, he shares this spiritual analogy of coming in, trying to overtake the strong man, all these different things. But after you've, after you've dealt with that, it moves on into this, draw near to God. I love this phrase. You are always as close to God as you want to be. People will come up to me all the time. Well, pastor, I just don't feel close to God. And I'll just pull out the Bible and say, well, um, are you drawing near to him? Because how many of you believe that the Bible's infallible without any mixture of error? It's the truth. It's the word of God. And God's word says that if you'll draw near to him, that he'll draw near to you. So if you're feeling distant from God, kick the shoe off. Don't feel that way. Draw near to him. Draw near to him and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart, you double-minded. Double so, th- so this is two other steps in this process in spiritual warfare. Cleansing your hands, you sinners. Okay, so what that looks like, and I don't need you to hold your hands out or anything like that, but I want you to figuratively uh, imagine that your, your hands, it represents your soul, okay? Th- this represents your mind, your will, and your emotions, things that are, that are going on. The real you inside of this external thing that's sitting in a chair. I mean the real you. And when the Bible says, cleanse your heart, you sinners, what, what the Bible is describing there is it's, it's doing, 
it's doing an internal audit of things that, that are going on inside of you. Why, why are you so given to anger? Why? Cleanse your heart. So the Bible says, and we're cleansed, the Bible says that we're cleansed by the washing of the water of the word. So we use the word of God to help wash our soul, wash these hands. So what this looks like is cleanse your hands, you filthy sinner. That means I'm going to, and, and sometimes I do this. Like, I'll just hold my hands out. And I'll say, what am I holding on to? And just allow the Holy Spirit to do an internal audit on you. Why are you so angry? Why are you so full of lust? Why? Why is pornography just such an easy thing? Why is it such a crutch for you? Why, why are you bitter? Why, why do you have this jealousy inside of you? Where is that jealousy stemming from? So cleansing your hands, it's just taking an audit of of what God's word says over you and things that you've allowed to fester in your life, in your marriage, in your personal life. Cleansing your hands, it's it's asking the hard questions that you don't want to ask that a lot of people pay $100 an hour to a counselor for. This, I'll save you money. Go before God. I love counseling. I believe in them. Every person should have a counselor. Don't hear me wrong. You should have a counselor. I have one. You need a counselor. You, You, tell your neighbor, you definitely need a counselor. But it's, it's just learning to just cleanse your hands before the Lord. What have I said today? How have I been angry with my mouth? Have I deceived, have I deceived anybody? Because what happens is, is little things over a while pile up on you. Because what, what looks like as a business owner, you know, getting a little, little one over on somebody becomes your pattern and eventually it becomes your character. So it's this constant process of just cleansing your hands every day. What do I need? So, will you do me a favor and stand with me? You don't have to say it out loud. I just want you to, I just want you to ask in your mind, Holy Spirit, what do I need to cleanse my hands from? Why am I given to these things? Why am I given to addiction? Why, why am I given to loneliness? Why am I given to, all you're doing is just cleansing your hands. Why do I have this need to be needed? Why do I feel like I have to keep up with the Joneses? Why, like, where is that coming from? So cleanse your hands, you sinners. And we sin because we all fall short of God's glorious standard, but we do it because the enemy inflicts wounds on us. You know, the enemy is a great fisherman. He fishes, he puts out a lure that he knows that you're gonna bite on, and he tempts you with it, and then when you bite on it, then he laughs at you. And then he repeats the cycle over and over again. Will you quit biting on the same bait and get back to the process of cleansing your hands before the Lord and just saying, what part of me isn't whole? I love the word integrity. It comes from the root word integer, which is where we get the the word uh, for whole number. It's being whole. That's integrity. It's just being whole in your soul. Imagine what your life would look like today if you could leave whole in your soul. Not a hole in your soul anymore, H-O-L-E, but actually having wholeness in your soul. Boy, your whole life would look different if you allowed Jesus to come in there and bring some healing to that. The Pharisees were worried about the outside of the cup looking good. Jesus said, don't do that. Jesus said, worry about the inside because it's, it's out of the inner vessel that everything else comes out of. And if you can get that inside whole, oh man, it'll change your life. It'll change your life. So cleanse your hands Then it moves on to purify your heart, you double-minded. Double-mindedness is something that James attacks like an assassin through his book. And what what, what he's referring to there is a mind that loves the kingdom of God and and kingdom things, but then also a mind that's fixated on the world and the lust and the desires and the things that gratify our flesh and things like that. James attacks it like an assassin. He says, don't don't live like that, you're double-minded. And notice that he talks about double-mindedness in the area of your heart. And what does the Bible say? The Bible says to seek first the kingdom of God in priority. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So the Bible has a lot to say about your, about your heart. But your, your heart, is the, it's, the, it's the seeding place of your passions. It's what your passions sit on top of. It's what, it's what produces your passions, your excitement, your encouragement. And all of that is produced in your heart. And it comes up there and it sits on top of there. So the thing to make your heart whole is by not having a divided mind. So maybe today 
You know, in the next few moments, I'm going to ask the prayer team to come forward. Maybe today you just need to spend this last song purifying your hands. Or maybe you need to spend the last few moments and you need to get double-mindedness out of your heart. It's not God and. It's God, period. In my life, over my life, Lord of my life.